Uh, thanks for having me here. So we're going to talk about pitching today. How do you pitch an idea to convince the other person to give you money for it, to distribute it, or to help you in some way? It's a big part of the entertainment business. You need to be good at pitching. And I have a lot of thoughts about pitching, and I want to share them with you. Many of them are counterintuitive, but we're going to dig right into them here. So first I want to tell you a little bit about myself. So my name is Scott Dickers, and this is going to go on and on. It's going to be pretty insufferable, but <laughs> there's a point. I'm going to get to that. So I came into the entertainment business first by being a cartoonist. And I had a, an early success. And by early, I mean after six years of thankless hard work in which I never got paid. But my first car uh, cartoon was a comic strip called Jim's Journal. And I did it for my college humor newspaper. And it became really popular. And I syndicated it to other college newspapers. I printed t-shirts with my characters on them that made me hundreds of dollars a month from a local t-shirt store. When I had enough comic strips, I put them together in a book that I self-published and hand-delivered to bookstores. And that book made the New York Times bestseller list. So that's how popular my comic strip was. And I had wanted to be in comedy my whole life. So this was a big dream come true for me to actually be making a living doing comedy. Super exciting. Another one of my claims to fame is I am the founding editor of The Onion. The Onion came about because I was a popular cartoonist in town. These two guys who wanted to start this campus humor magazine came to me because I was like the big campus comedy celebrity and wanted me involved and I jumped right into it. I thought it was great. I ended up buying it from those two guys about a year in and ran it and was the editor of it for many years. And it's been very successful. It's like a multi-million dollar company at this point. I am also uh, the writer and director of two feature films, many short films, but two feature films, uh, Spaceman and Bad Meat, both of which uh, have been sold for independent distribution. Uh, Spaceman, my first one, uh, won the Audience Award at the Film Festival in Austin. Uh, it was a great time. Uh, Bad Meat, we actually got uh, a movie star to be in it. We got Chevy Chase to be in it. And both were really fun experiences. I learned a ton. Most important thing I learned, which I might get to later, is uh, I really don't enjoy directing movies. Because sometimes you have to do something twice to really realize, all right, I shouldn't be doing this. I am also a number one best-selling author. So yeah, my, my cartoon made the New York Times bestseller list, but I think it peaked at like number nine on the college market list, very small list. But since then, I've written many more humor books. I've written about 25 humor books, I think. And uh, many of them have been on the New York Times bestseller list. Uh, a couple of them hit number one. And that's an amazing adjective to have before your name, number one best-selling author. I recommend it highly. <laughs> and you can actually do that. There's a system, and I didn't do this, but there's a way people do that now where you can pay someone to make your book a number one New York Times best-selling book. A little harder with the New York Times, the USA Today is much easier where you buy a certain number of books and you have certain people from various parts of the country buy your book and it makes the sales numbers go up. They have a very strange rubric for how they figure out uh, what the best sellers are. Uh, I made the list by just selling the most books <laughs> and that's the best way to do it. But it really doesn't matter. It's a great adjective because when you're a number one best-selling author, that precedes you everywhere and you can get speaking gigs, you can uh, get interviewed places, you're suddenly credible. You're suddenly a person who matters. So if you're going in to pitch an idea and you're a number one best-selling author, they're like, oh, well, this person knows what they're talking about, even if you don't. So it's a wonderful thing to have. I am also uh, the winner of many prestigious awards. So this is something you don't often get in comedy until you've been in the business for many years. Most people slave away in comedy and do great work. If they're ever acknowledged for that work, um, it happens very late in their careers. Like, you know, I think Will Ferrell won the Mark Twain Prize after being in the business for 20, 25 years, something like that. But I've been in the business for like 40 years at this point, so I've racked up some awards. The Onion won a Peabody Award for uh, the web videos that I produced, and we've won more Webby Awards than any other uh, individual or organization in the world. That's uh, The Onion's claim to fame. Uh, I've also won the Thurber Prize for American Humor, which is a very prestigious award that came with $500, I'll have you know. Very exciting. So uh, 
one more thing on this insufferable list of boastful credits is I created the Onion News Network, which is a brand uh, affiliated with The Onion that we started in the mid-2000s that was uh, a video news uh, brand. And we made video news clips and put them online. They were parodies of the kind of news clips that you saw online at that time from Fox News or whatever. And the, the Onion has been very successful and it's what won us the Peabody Award. And this is my body of work and this is, these are all the things that I have done. So I know a thing or two about how to get a project started, how to get it going, how to make money at it, and how to pitch it successfully. So uh, I'll get into more details about how some of this happened as I illustrate to you my best practices for pitching. So the way that you get things to happen in life, pitching or no, is by having goals. So the way that I achieved all that stuff, the way that the Onion became a multi-million dollar company, the way that I produced two feature films, the, the way that I began my career in, in comedy with my own comic strip that took literally no money to get started in was by having goals. Everybody needs to have goals. Everybody in the entertainment industry especially needs to know where they want to go so they can plot out the steps to get there. You can't get where you're going if you literally don't know where that is. If you're just flailing around saying, oh, I think I'll do this, I think I'll do that, and you don't really have a plan. So I want to tie this with the idea of pitching because it's very integral. When you're goal-oriented and when you're passionate about pursuing your goals, that's an attractive quality to people that you're pitching to. If you're somebody on a mission who has passion for your work, uh, people in the industry value that almost above anything else. The, the only thing they might value more is somebody who can make a ton of money. So let's get into that. Goal setting workshop. Sit down and write your pie in the sky goals. What's the most outrageously uh, impossible thing you want to achieve? Do you want to be the emperor of the entertainment business? Write it down. And write it down in detail. List like what your life is going to look like when you've achieved this, how it's going to feel when you achieve this. That's your kind of mission statement, your, your pie in the sky goal. And then what you want to do is break that down into a five year goal. Let's say you want to be emperor of the entertainment business. That's, let's realistically say that's a 10 year goal. So where do you need to be in five years for that to happen? Maybe you need to have produced a couple of movies. Maybe you need to have a best selling book, whatever. And then break that down into two years. Where do you need to be two years from now for you to get to that end point? And then where do you need to be at one year to get to that point. And then break it down even further, where do, you, where do you need to be at the end of this month to get to your one year goal, which is going to get to your two and five, et cetera. This is how you achieve your pie in the sky goals, is by setting them and then plotting out the int incremental steps that are achievable. The incremental steps are achievable and over time you realize, hey, I've gotten pretty close to my impossible pie in the sky goal. My goal when I started out was to be like Steven Spielberg. I wanted to be the king of Hollywood. I wanted to be a filmmaker who could make any movie he wanted. That was it. And I made this goal when I was about 16. So I plotted out my steps and I figured out, okay, that's my pie in the sky. And I backed it up, okay, what do I need to do in five years? What do I need to do in two? What do I need to do in one? And I decided, well, first, I need to be making movies, because he made movies in high school. So I made movies all the time. I got a Super 8 camera, and I just made a lot of movies. They were expensive. Uh, some of my movies I made in the summer of like my junior year of high school, like $200 for a 15-minute movie. Like That was all the money you could make detasseling seed corn in the summer. And that was, th that was it. And then I knew I needed to go to the USC film school, because that was the best film school. And Spielberg couldn't get in, but Lucas got in, and a lot of other important people got into USC. So I flunked out of high school, and I managed to get test into the University of Wisconsin. But I did really well, and I studied really hard because I knew what my goal was. I wanted to get to USC. Then I transferred, once I had good transfer grades, I transferred to this random school in Connecticut. It was actually a great experience, and did really well there. They had a, a middling film school. And from there, I was able to uh, transfer to USC, wh where I got in. And I uh, went to the film school for like a semester until I was disillusioned and dropped out, 
long story, not important to go into, but I actually made it. I made it there. And a few years later, after getting into cartooning and The Onion started up, I took a hiatus from The Onion because I had a movie in me that had to come out. And I still had this goal deep inside of me, that, like, I want to make movies. So I made um, Spaceman. And I made it much like my old Super 8 movies, just as cheaply as I could. And uh, did really well with it. And, and it opened a lot of doors for me in Hollywood. And I got meetings with producers and agents and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I was well on my way. But by that point, my goals had changed. But look at how much I achieved, even though I didn't achieve the status of being the next Steven Spielberg. I got really close. And that's the power of goals. And you should revisit them and reset them every once in a while to make sure that you're actually pursuing what you want. That's actually one of the hardest things about goals is knowing what you want and how that's different from what other people think you should want. Like we walk, we go through life thinking you, we want certain things when actually we don't. We just want them because we think society wants us to want them. Maybe that's just me, but I, I do see that and I think it's an issue that we should definitely have some consciousness about. To complete our little goal setting workshop, uh, I have to mention Arnold Schwarzenegger because he is the master of goal setting and you need to look to him for how goal setting works. Arnold Schwarzenegger was a skinny kid in Austria who didn't speak a word of English when he was 15. But he dreamed of being the king of Hollywood. And he had a pie in the sky goal that he was going to be a big movie star, he's going to be a millionaire, and uh, he was going to be able to make any movie he wanted. So how does he get there? Well, he plots out the incremental steps. Now luckily for him, he had a model in Reg Park who was a, a guy who became a bodybuilder and then got hired to be uh, Hercules, I think, in a movie. And Arnold saw a magazine article about him that profiled his career and like how he got where he got. And Arnold was like, all right, well, I'm just going to do exactly what he did. So he started lifting weights because he figured, well, if I'm a big muscular guy, then I can play superheroes in movies or whatever. And so he spends the next three, four years lifting weights. He goes AWOL from the Austrian military to compete in his first bodybuilding competition, and he wins. And from there, he keeps doing bodybuilding competitions. Eventually, he moves to America uh, because he knows that's where you have to be. He moves to Hollywood because he knows that's where you have to be. And he's laying bricks for a living with other uh, bodybuilding buddies. So his other goal was he wanted to be a millionaire. And a lot of people don't know this. Arnold Schwarzenegger was a millionaire before he ever got a movie role because it was his goal, and he pursued it, and he knew how to do that. He decided he was going to get there through real estate. So he met the top real estate maven in Los Angeles, befriended her, and she drove him around town, showed him the business, and he saved his money from bricklaying, and he was becoming kind of a known bodybuilder at this point. He was able to sell supplements. He saved money from that. He put a down payment on the apartment building that he lived in. And so he owned this apartment building, and if any of you know anything about real estate, owning an apartment building is like the best investment you can make. It's an income producing property and pretty soon his net worth was a million dollars. So when he pursued his goal of being a big movie star, he went into these meetings in Hollywood and met with these big producers after getting a couple of small parts just because he was this spectacular looking specimen. He got a few little parts here and there. But he took these meetings and he had this attitude like he didn't care. He was already a millionaire. Like hire me in your stupid movie, I don't care. And that attitude wowed them. They were like, oh my god, this guy's got chutzpah. Like, he's an action star. And so they take chances on him. And he gets the Hercules movie, then he gets the Terminator, and then it's all uphill from there. So I could go on. He, he decided later he wanted to get into politics. What happened? He became the governor of California. He wanted to marry a Kennedy. Who has that goal? I want to marry a Kennedy. He achieved it. So what's his magic? He does what I'm telling you to do. He does the pie in the sky goal, and then he does the incremental goals. But he does this thing where he, he calls it locking it in. And it's literally like envisioning the achievement of the goal in his mind in as realistic a way as possible, and then locking his heat-seeking missile on it. So it's locked in in his mind. And at that point, he's unstoppable. Nothing can stop him from achieving those goals. And he's a master at it. And I recommend checking out his... Uh, biography. I think it's an autobiography. Total Recall. Yeah, autobiography. <laughs> and um, get more insight into how he does this and just his attitude about it. It's such a, uh, an incredibly inspirational story. 
So my attitude about goal setting is uh, shoot for the moon. Because even if you miss, you're still among the stars. Like I missed. I'm not the next Steven Spielberg, but I did OK. I did fine. And uh, you can aspire to be as proficient at goal achieving as Arnold Schwarzenegger, but we're not all going to be Arnold Schwarzenegger. Uh, but if we get close, that's pretty good. And that's why I advocate pie in the sky goals, because the more outrageously impossible your goals are, the more likely when and if you miss, the stars that you are among are going to be pretty awesome. What are some other tools that you can use to achieve your goals? One is you need to learn your craft. Anyone who achieves anything, especially in the entertainment business, gets experience doing the thing that they want to do. Steven Spielberg made movies all the time. Uh, I made movies all the time. I wrote comedy stories. I wrote comic strips all the time. Doing something and doing it over and over and over gets you good at it eventually. Practice makes perfect. So if you want to do comedy, you need to learn the craft of comedy. I recommend my book, How to Write Funny. Uh, yeah, there it is. Uh, I encapsulated everything I know about how to write comedy in this book, How to Write Funny. It's my first nonfiction book. And the core of it is what I call the 11 funny filters. And anyone who writes jokes and makes comedy needs to know what these 11 funny filters are. They're the 11 different ways that jokes are made. And be able to filter whatever you want to say through these funny filters to come out with a joke on the other side uh, to make comedy. So in the uh, classes that I teach here at the Second City and uh, some online through the How to Write Funny website, people learn this system and go from being not very funny to being like professionally funny in a very short time period. So a lot of times, at least in the past, people had to do trial and error comedy for years and years and years before they got good at it. You don't have to do that anymore. Uh, you can take, uh, take my advice or take a class at the Second City and you can learn comedy pretty quickly. You also need to produce a lot of work. Uh, you all know Gla Malcolm Gladwell's 10,000 hours theory. If you do something obsessively for about 10 years, which is about 10,000 hours of obsessive work, you'll get good at it. Uh, I didn't become uh, a successful cartoonist until I've been doing it about six or seven years. I think I was probably doing it more obsessively than Malcolm Gladwell prescribed. I was probably doing it 60 and 17 hours a day. But The Onion didn't become famous until we had been doing it for about 10 years, a little over nine. So we did something over and over and over. We figured out how to do satire, and we got good at it. So the, the 11 funny filters in How to Write Funny are, we're just going to plow through them really quick, irony, character, reference, shock, hyperbole, parody, wordplay, analogy, madcap, misplaced focus, and meta humor. They're all detailed in the book. But those are the 11 different kinds of jokes, the 11 different ways that you can make things funny that anyone serious about a career in comedy needs to know and master. Because there's like rules and best practices for both. And another tip I want to give you for producing comedy is that quantity is the key to quality. You need to produce a lot of work to ever hope to achieve work that's good. The best comic minds produce volumes of jokes before they select the one joke from among that pile that they're going to uh, present to an audience. Uh, it's just the, the way it's done. Think of it in terms of the way a photographer takes hundreds of shots to find one good one. It's exactly the same. The problem, though, is a lot of people in comedy feel like, well, if I produce hundreds of jokes, that means I'm terrible and no one should see my comedy. They somehow internalize it and think it's a reflection on them very differently from how a photographer thinks of their photos. But you need to think of them in the same way. You need to produce that volume, uh, that quantity, to get to the quality. All right. Especially when it comes to pitching. If you have one idea, like a lot of people who are comedy wannabes have one idea that they're in love with. And they're going to go out and they're going to pitch that idea. And it's never going to be uh, bought. It's never going to go anywhere. Because the person they're pitching to is going to sense, oh, this is your only idea. You've got nothing. People want to be in business with people who are prolific, who have a ton of ideas, and for whom ideas are not precious, because they're just going to keep producing more. One of the key ways you can tell an amateur uh, person in comedy from a professional person in comedy is that an amateur person has one joke, one concept, one idea that they're pitching. 
a professional has many. And they're going to select the best material for a pitch meeting or a project to uh, produce on their own or a project to sell yet still be involved with. They're going to have a range of projects uh, uh, that are ranked in terms of how passionate they are, how interested they are in being involved with them, et cetera, et cetera. So you should be coming up with a lot of ideas if you want to be in comedy. You should be generating at least 10 ideas a week. I recommend people write 10 ideas a day. And by ideas, I mean funny concepts, funny ideas for shows, funny website ideas, whatever you can come up with. And don't think logically, don't uh, edit yourself, just pour out 10 ideas without thinking. Take like 30 minutes. And then segment those ideas onto different lists. Let them sit for a week or two and then go through and call out the, the ones that are workable. Put your project ideas on one list. Put your ideas that you might pitch to someone on a different list. And just put general funny ideas on a, on a different list. And maybe tweet those out and see what happens, see what kind of reaction you get. You should have a list for TV show ideas, movie ideas, book ideas, uh, website ideas, uh, an idea for a stage show, an idea for street art, some punk that you're going to do and, and film, or ideas for podcasts. You should have a separate list for each one of these things because in comedy you never know where opportunity is going to come from. It could be somebody you know is like, hey, I, I've got a bunch of money and I've got a big backer for this uh, podcast. Do you have any ideas for a podcast? You don't want to be in the position of scrambling to come up with an idea. You want to go to your list and have like 20 amazing podcast ideas that you've compiled over the last several months. That's what uh, allows you to take advantage of opportunity when it comes. This is how opportunity comes in comedy. It's random, it's unpredictable, and if you put yourself in the right position and you do the right groundwork, you're going to open yourself up to a greater possibility of those opportunities happening. But when they do happen, you need to be ready to jump on them or you miss the window. And you might make it the next time, but why uh, leave yourself unprepared when those opportunities come? So then you need to ask yourself, is pitching even the right idea for your concept? Some ideas are on the list of ideas that you want to produce yourself that you don't necessarily want to pitch. You have to ask yourself that question. You should only be pitching the ideas that you are prepared to walk away from, or that you want help with, or that you think are expensive, that you, you'd need bigger backers in order to produce, et cetera, et cetera. You want to put some intentionality behind what ideas you should be pitching versus what ideas you should be executing yourself. I want to go through the conventional wisdom versus the actual wisdom on the differences between pitching and executing ideas yourself. These are the two worlds of entertainment that uh, I want to talk about. That I sort of feel like all work falls into one of those two categories. You're either going to pitch it to a big company and they're going to invest in you and they're going to produce it and distribute it, or you're going to execute it yourself on the cheap. Conventional wisdom says if you pitch something, one of the pros of pitching something is you get a lot of money. A big company is going to give you a big stack of money to produce your idea. One of the cons is that you'll have no control. They're going to give it to somebody else. You're going to be in development hell. You've heard the horror stories. One of the bits of conventional wisdom about executing the idea yourself, one of the pros is that you have total control. Nobody's telling you what to do. You don't have a boss. You don't have a development executive. You can do whatever you want with this project. <coughs> one of the cons, according to the conventional wisdom, is that you don't make any money, that you're doing it on the cheap, you're probably spending money. You're begging money from parents, friends, uh, you're putting up a GoFundMe or a Patreon just to finance your project. All right, that's the conventional wisdom. Let's talk about the actual wisdom. What are the pros and cons of pitching an idea? Well, one of the pros is the big one is that if you pitch an idea and sell it, you suddenly have legitimacy in the industry. If you've sold an idea to an established TV network or movie studio or production company, you've made it. You're legitimate. You now have a calling card. You go to a party, you can say, oh, yeah, I just did a deal with X, Y, and Z. And everybody's like, oh, you're somebody. You're not just a wannabe anymore. That's the 
highest value pro that you get from pitching an idea. Counter to the conventional wisdom, you also get control over your project. Because when you pitch something, you're not just pitching the idea, you're pitching yourself. And they're not going to buy your idea and just make it without you most of the time. Sometimes they'll do that. But ideally, they want you with it because if you're the genius behind it and you have the passion for the project, they want to bring you on, especially if you have uh, the right experience and you're ready for that kind of opportunity. You can leverage that to get as much control as you want. Because in Hollywood, like I said, what they respect almost more than anything else is someone who has an, a driving passion to execute a creative vision. Everybody respects that. And so if you have that, they want that kind of engine driving this project, and they want you on it, and they want you to, uh, they want you to, to manifest that passion in making sure that it's executed in the way you envision. So I want to give you a story about how that once happened to me and how I learned this valuable lesson. Because I went in thinking, oh, they buy your idea, now they're in charge. And I just say, yes, sir, and do what they say, because now it's theirs. They don't want that. that. Then you're a cuck to them. Then you're like, why am I in business with this person who's just doing what I say? I want somebody who's, who I can hand the football to and they're going to run for a touchdown. So what happened to me was I got a call when The Onion was first becoming famous uh, in the late 90s, I got a call from MTV. And they had an idea for um, a motion capture animation show about President Bill Clinton that they wanted to do. And they thought it should be satirical, so they were calling The Onion to see if we had some writers that we could recommend for this show. So I'm not a salesperson. I'm not particularly good with people. I'm kind of an introvert. Kind of. I'm a recluse. And I don't normally talk to people. I'm usually just stuck in my office writing. So I get this call, but I'm filled with confidence at this point because The Onion has gotten pretty famous. And I don't care. MTV, yeah, whatever. And I, I said, oh, OK, that sounds like a pretty good idea. Uh, I'd like to be involved in that show. And um, I talked to the guy, the development executive at MTV about what he was thinking for the show. And I was like, yeah, that sounds pretty cool. I threw some ideas at him, like what I thought it could be. I was thinking it'd be like this computer-generated Bill Clinton that was engineered to appeal to a young audience. And he would play videos. Because in those days, like on Beavis and Butthead, they would just play videos and have VJs or whatever. And I thought that could be really funny. And I had been doing a Bill Clinton impression on radio and in TV skits and on NPR for many years. I thought I had the best Bill Clinton. I was like, well, I'm going to play Bill Clinton on this show. So I didn't tell him this, but I knew this. And so that night, I went to my little recording studio that I put together uh, where we recorded the Onion Radio News and some other things. And I produced a pilot episode of this show. I took a photo of Bill Clinton, and then I made some motion graphics around him in uh, After Effects. And I did the voice uh, as this like computer-generated Bill Clinton. And I put it on VHS. So this is late 90s. That's the technology we had. And I overnighted it to the guy. And he was blown away. He was like, oh my god, this is the show. And he made me uh, a creator, a co-creator of the show. He made me an executive producer. And he made me the star of the show. Just because I stepped up and I showed passion and I showed that I had a vision for this show that I, I could execute. And so they produced a few episodes of this show. And the Onion writers and I uh, helped to write it. And I performed uh, the voice. And from that, I got cast on their other show, Celebrity Deathmatch, where they had like celeb claymation celebrities fighting each other. So it led to other work. So what I was saying before about how you never know where opportunity is going to come, and you need to be ready and poised to leverage that opportunity. I didn't know MTV was going to call me that day. But was I ready for that opportunity? I knew how to write satire. I knew how to do Bill Clinton. I had a recording studio. <laughs> I knew After Effects. Like I had done the groundwork. I was totally prepared for that opportunity to maximize it. This is often how things happen. This is often how ideas get made. It's not the traditional, uh, could I come pitch my idea? And then you come in and you pitch your idea, and they say, oh, that's pretty interesting. I'll let you know. Like That's one way to do it. Um, it's not my preferred way to do it. Let's move on. 
more actual wisdom about pitching versus executing. Another con of pitching an idea and selling it to a big company, the conventional wisdom said you make a lot of money from doing that, but the actual wisdom is you don't make a lot of money from doing that. Do you know how many TV networks there are right now? And do you know how much uh, content they have to produce? So many people I know who I've met in my years in the comedy business have their own TV shows now. They're not millionaires. You know, if you break down the amount of hours they work to produce their show, they're barely making a teacher's salary. They're barely making minimum wage for some of these shows, especially on the smaller networks like Adult Swim or even on Comedy Central. So don't go in thinking this is your fuck you money. This is like, no, you're gonna be barely making a livable wage. Another con of pitching it is there's just low odds. The odds of you going in and pitching an idea and then buying it and making it are a million to one. Now you can read the trade magazines and you'll see every day there's an idea that's pitched and sold. But there are a million pitched. How many were sold? One. So that's a big con of pitching it. The actual wisdom is correct. Uh, I mean the conventional wisdom is correct when compared to the actual wisdom when it comes to the pros of executing it yourself because you do have control just like you thought you did in the conventional wisdom. You have control both, t both ways if you step up and take it. But you also make money when you execute it yourself. I want to tell you a little story about that. I told you about how I self-published my first book, uh, the first collection of Jim's Journal cartoons which I called I Went to College and It Was Okay. Hmm. I self-published the book and it made the national bestseller list and I made a ton of money because I was making half of every book sale because there was no middleman. I hand delivered it to the bookstores, they sold it on consignment and they paid me half. The book was like 12 bucks, I made six bucks per book. Once I made the national bestseller list, I got a call from the top cartoon book publisher, Andrews McNeil. They publish all the Calvin and Hobbes books, the Far Side books, they're the best. And they were who I modeled my books after. I studied their books and laid out my book just like theirs. And so when they called me and said, hey, we saw your book on the bestseller list, we'd like to sign a contract with you and distribute your books. I was like, yes. I didn't even have to look at the contract. I was all over that. What I learned after getting an agent and doing the contract and like getting my books sold, now no longer were my books just in the bookstores that I could walk to or mail to. They were all over the English speaking world. I made less money because now I was making 7% per book, which is kind of the, the average of what you can expect when you do a book deal with a major publisher. So they were all over, but they weren't selling as much because I wasn't there building fancy cardboard displays to give to the stores, which I did in Madison. Uh, I wasn't hand delivering them and checking up on the sales when they uh, were out. I would go back and say, hey, it looks like you're out. Can I give, bring you more? There was one or two books in every store as opposed to dozens when I was selling it. So combine that with the royalty, I, just, I wasn't making as much money. And I look back on that and was like shocked that I made more money self-publishing my book than I did with a major publisher. And that's the case with a lot of projects. I'll give you some more examples later. But there's one more pro of executing it they want to talk about and that is it gives you standing. Standing is slightly different from legitimacy, which I talked about as one of the pros of pitching it. Legitimacy is when you've made it. You're like a made guy in the mob. You're part of the club. You've made a deal with a big company. You can go to any party and, and have that be your calling card and people respect you. Standing is slightly different. Standing is like pre-legitimacy. Standing is when you have succeeded outside of the entertainment industry but people in the entertainment industry maybe have heard of you or notice you and think that you're ready to be invited into the club. That's what I mean by standing. And when you execute something yourself that gets a little traction, that maybe gets some views, maybe builds an audience, that gives you standing. And when you set up a pitch meeting and you have standing, you're in a much more powerful position to sell your ideas. When you have legitimacy, you're in the most powerful position you can be, but standing is great. When you go to like a pitch fest and you're in this cattle call of people pitching this poor executive who had to go to this pitch fest and listen to all these amateurs pitching their ideas, you have no standing and you're never going to sell that idea. I mean, you might, one in a zillion chance. 
But executing it gives you standing. One of the cons of executing it yourself is that it's hard work. However, it's hard work to pitch an idea and sell it and work on it. You're going to be working hard either way. You're going to be putting in the long hours, the sleepless nights. That's just how it is in the entertainment business, especially when you're starting out. Everybody expects you to uh, work 14-hour days and commit your life to the work. That's why they like people with passion, because they know that they're self-powered to do that. They don't need to be compelled to do that in any way. And one of the big cons of executing things yourself is that it takes longer. It takes more time. Now, you could get lucky, and you could produce something that goes viral, and you could be an overnight success. But that's, again, one in a zillion chance. Typically, it takes a long time to get good at something, to build a body of work. It took me six years to succeed in comic strips. It took me almost 10 years to succeed at The Onion. It took me 20 years to succeed at making movies. So know that, know that this is your actual wisdom. These are the actual pros and cons between pitching an idea and executing an idea yourself. There are more cons to pitching. When you pitch an idea to a development executive in Hollywood, you are ceding power to that executive. You're going in there and saying, I am a beta, you are an alpha, and I'm here asking you for an opportunity. Hollywood is like high school with money. That's what Martin Mull said many years ago, and it's totally true. It's all about popularity and clicks and who hangs out with who, who's cool, who's not cool. When you're a beta, are you cool? No. Nobody wants to be in business with somebody who's not cool. That's why if you have standing and you go and pitch an idea, you're going to be much more likely to sell that idea because you're like the new kid in school who's actually good looking and good at sports and people are like, oh, I like the new kid. But if, you're the, if you don't have standing, if you haven't made any projects that have gotten any traction outside of the industry, you're like the new kid who everybody hates, who smells and who gets beaten up. Nobody's going to be in business with you. Nobody's going to want to make a project with you. Another uh, pitching con is that you're giving away your idea. And just know that going in. So on your list of ideas that you want to pitch, make sure those are ideas that you are OK losing. Because these people in Hollywood, they hear pitches all day. And when you go in, especially if the meeting was set up through an agent, there's an implied creative release that you sign that says they may produce an idea similar to yours, and you have no legal recourse if they do. That's just the realities of the business. If they're hearing ideas all day, and they accidentally make an idea like yours months uh, from now, what can you do? Uh, and it's probably going to happen. It's happened to me several times. And I want to tell you one particular example. I wrote a screenplay called Future Boy. And I sent it around. And I got a bunch of meetings. It was about a boy from the future who comes to the present. And he's got all these cool gadgets. And it was a fun, you know, fun, silly movie. And I pitched it to somebody at Disney. A few months later, Disney comes out with this TV show, Phil of the Future. And he's a teenager from the future who comes to the present. He's got all these cool gadgets. Now, do I get angry? Do I call this person at Disney? Do I call my manager and say, hey, they stole my idea? No, I don't say that. Um, I actually call the person and I, I tell them, hey, congratulations, saw the show. Because the person I met with was attached to the show. They were like a producer on the show. That's how you have to play the game. You have to be cool. Because a cool person is like, hey, congratulations. It's great. So happy for you. An uncool person is that guy. Anybody know who that is? There's a reason you don't know who that is. Because he destroyed his career in Hollywood by doing the wrong thing in this situation. He went to Hollywood and pitched this hilarious movie idea about a prince from Africa who comes to America to find his bride. And they said no. And then, a little later, somebody made Coming to America with Eddie Murphy. What did he do? He sued. This is columnist Art Buckwald. He's a USA Today, was a USA Today columnist. And he sued for like a million dollars. I think they settled for maybe a quarter million dollars or something. So he got some money. He got a settlement out of it. Nobody ever called him again. Nobody's ever going to work with him again. Who's going to work with somebody who sues people? 
who pisses in the bathwater. Hollywood is a very small community. It's like a small town. Once you're in the business, you know almost everyone else in the business, just like in a small town. If you're pissing at everybody and suing people, you're never going to work again because everybody talks, everybody knows each other. Think of it as uh, high school. It's like you challenged the cool kid uh, to a fight and then you sucker punched him. Nobody's ever going to be your friend. One more pitching con is know that your ideas are worthless to them. Whoever you're pitching to, they don't care about your ideas. There's probably 10 other people that week who pitched the same idea as you. It doesn't matter. The commodity is you, what you bring to it, how much passion you have behind it, how much standing you have, or maybe how much legitima legitimacy you have. The idea really doesn't matter. Now again, there are exceptions. On rare occasions, somebody can sell an idea uh, when, when they have no standing and they're not cool, if the idea is attractive enough, but it's one in a million. A final con of pitching ideas and selling them is that you're likely to get sucked into development hell. Now you all know what development hell is. If you want a very detailed description of what it's like to be in development hell, read the book Monster by John Gregory Dunn. He details the process of how he wrote a screenplay about Jessica Savage, this uh, news anchor who's like one of the first female news anchors. Um, and the trials and tribulations of her making it in this male-dominated business. He wanted to make this intelligent satire or whatever. He sold the script and it got sucked into development hell and they kept changing it and changing it and changing it. And it ended up being this stupid romantic comedy with Robert Redford and uh, I think Michelle Pfeiffer. It had nothing to do with Jessica Savage and had no satire at all. Satire, again, not, not, a, um, not considered a marketable genre for movies. Okay, so here are some examples of projects that were not pitched, but that succeeded anyway. Projects and people. I already talked about The Onion. If The Onion had been pitched to somebody with money in the first year of its existence, they would have said no. Nobody had ever heard of a humor newspaper before. This is not a thing you did. A lot of people didn't get the humor. It's like, you have a headline, pen stolen from dorm study area? I don't get it. Why are there coupons on the front page? It looks terrible. The Onion survived by local advertising dollars. We had to have coupons on the front page so people would clip them and use them so advertisers would know that people were reading The Onion so we could sell ads and keep paying for the printing and keep uh, staying in publication. But we executed it ourselves. It was a lot of hard work. We didn't make a lot of money at first. And it took a long time. The other example I gave you already was my comic strip, Jim's Journal, which had I sent it to Andrews McNeil without having produced a comic strip, without having produced t-shirts, without having produced my own first book that made the bestseller list, do you think they would have said, oh, we love this comic strip, we'd love to syndicate it to newspapers nationwide? Absolutely not. It was stick figures, it used meta humor, uh, which a lot of people don't get, and there's no way I would have successfully pitched that idea. By executing it myself, I actually succeeded at it and made a career out of it. Trump's America, buy this book and Mexico will pay for it. This is a self-published book that I produced as part of the classes that I run here at the Second City. We do uh, this Writing with the Onion program and there's four levels to the program. And the uh, first level is pretty basic, it goes through the funny filters. And then the final level, the fourth level, is called the master class, where we pick a project. And we do the project from start to finish. And the first master class project was in the fall of 2015, we decided we're going to do a book about Donald Trump, about what it would be like if he became president. Because he had just announced that he was running. And we thought, you know, even if he doesn't make it, he's a celebrity, uh, he's worth making fun of, we'll do this book. So, we worked really hard, nobody got paid. In fact, the people working on it were students who paid to be in the class. And we produced this beautiful full color book. It's like a uh, voter's guide to what life is gonna be like in a Donald Trump presidency. And we released it, uh, self-published, 
in the spring of 2016. And I think it was around the time when he was shockingly still in the race, because everyone thought he was going to get uh, uh, beaten by Jeb Bush or somebody else was going to, some, you know, crazy um, full paw was going to eject him immediately from consideration. But he got the nomination, and our book sold really well. We got a lot of good press on it, and I did a lot of interviews where I predicted that he would win the election, which nobody was predicting. Everybody thought Hillary would win. And, but since we had done so much research for this book, I knew him, and I, thought I, I really thought he was going to win based on what I knew about him. And when he won the election, Simon & Schuster called up and said, we want your book. And they offered a big uh, six, I mean, sorry, five, high five-figure advance, um, which we split equally among all the writers of the book. So everybody took the class, got a little chunk of money, and uh, the book did really well. I actually did pitch the book to my agent when we started writing it. The only reason we did it independently was because everyone said no. All the big publishers said no. Ah, Trump is going to be gone by the, by the uh, winter. He's never going to last the primary process. So. Sometimes executing something yourself and proving that you were right, that your vision for the, uh, what this project could be is more powerful than the development executive's vision. And sometimes you just need to execute it to show them. And they can say, oh, I see now how, why this works. And then they want in. OK, one more example of something that was never pitched was a podcast that I did in the mid-2000s called The Weekly Radio Address. This is a podcast I did independent of The Onion, and my name wasn't on it. It was all done kind of anonymously. And it got to be really popular. It was a parody of the president's weekly radio address, which the president used to do ever since FDR. Every week, they'd do like this minute or two address to the American people, where they'd just say what's going on, and they'd do it on Saturday morning. And sometimes news networks would play it with a picture of the president or whatever. And George W. Bush was president, and I thought it'd be fun to just make fun of him and do this uh, weekly radio address. And it got to be really popular. It was like the top 10 or 15 of iTunes for a long time. And we got a book deal out of it. Uh, we got like a quarter million dollar advance for an um, autobiography of, of George, George W. Bush based on this podcast. Again, no one would have bought that idea had I pitched it. Because at that time, there were no big podcast companies. Podcasting was new. And individuals were just discovering this new medium and putting out product. Once we get some sort of traction with the podcast, though, then a publisher is interested because they see how many listeners we have. And they know, oh, you have a platform, so you might help sell this book. So that's why they take a chance and why it's better to execute something before you pitch it. You all know who Robert Rodriguez is, I trust. Robert Rodriguez lived the example that I'm talking about. He wanted to make movies. He wanted to sell movies and make money. He figured he could make it in the Mexican direct-to-video, direct-to-home video market. So he borrowed a 16 millimeter camera from the Austin Film School. He had a friend who had a bus. He had a friend who had a guitar. And he had another friend who had a pit bull. And so he came up with a movie that involved a bus, a guitar, and a pit bull, and shot this movie for $7,000 called, called El Mariachi. And he edited the movie literally on VHS tape by syncing two VHS tape machines. And he submitted it to the Sundance Film Festival. He got in. He became the toast of Hollywood because Miramax bought the movie. They re-edited it. They redid the sound. And they released it, still advertising it as a $7,000 movie, even though they'd put hundreds of thousands of dollars into making it more presentable. But still, Robert Rodriguez had standing because he was so impressive for having made this movie himself for $7,000. Not only that, but he had uh, undergone medical experimentation to make money to finance his movie. This is a guy who had passion. He also did a comic strip for his uh, college newspaper. And they saw the whole package of him. And they're like, oh my god, this guy can do anything. And now he kind of does everything. He makes his own movies. He didn't even have to move to Hollywood. He stayed in Texas. And he has his own movie studio where he makes uh, those Spy Kids movies and the um, Sin City movies. All, he, he's uh, a guy who writes his own ticket in the, the business. 
He had standing, which immediately led to legitimacy. He never had to pitch his idea. Do you guys know who Andy Weir is? He's the guy who wrote The Martian, that movie with Matt Damon. Do you know that that movie started as a blog article by Andy Weir? Here's a guy who had a story about an astronaut who survives on Mars and decided to start writing it on his blog. And his readers responded positively to it, so he kept writing it. Every time he posted a new chapter, the story would evolve. And he was uh, taking notes from his audience, and he was a scientist himself, and so he put a lot of really real science in there about how somebody would survive on Mars. And he finished the book on his blog, and his readers said, hey, you should self-publish this on Amazon. And he was like, really? OK. So he uploaded it to Amazon. And it started selling really well. People responded to it. He optioned it to a movie company, and they made the movie with Matt Damon. Who thinks if he had gone to a pitch meeting before he ever wrote that first blog article and pitched the idea of an astronaut surviving on Mars, who thinks he would have sold that idea? No. He sold the idea because he executed it himself. He made a successful book out of it, and that book got optioned. Do you know the show Teachers on TV Land? Funny show. So the genesis of the show Teachers was a comedy troupe here at the Second City in Chicago called the Katie Dids. All the members of the troupe are named Catherine, Kate, or Katie. And they produced a web series called Teachers. They found a local production company and partnered with them so it would have good production value. And they wrote these really funny little bits uh, about school teachers. Some of them are teachers, so they had a lot of experience. And I was working at The Onion when they did this web series, and I found it, and I thought it was funny, and so we promoted it on The Onion website. We pretended like it was an Onion show. They got an agent, they went to Hollywood, and they pitched it, and they sold it to TV Land and made a TV series out of it. They would not have sold that idea if they had just gone to Hollywood as their ensemble and said, hey, we have an idea about teachers. It took them executing it, uh, doing a proof of concept for development executives to see what it could be and take a chance on it. Anybody know who that is? The guy who just popped up above teachers. That's Steven Spielberg. So he's the king of Hollywood. Did he ever have to pitch an idea? Yes, of course he's pitched ideas. But how did he get into the business? He did exactly what I'm recommending. He made movies in high school. He produced a feature film when he was 17 and released it at a local movie theater, charged money for people to come in and watch it. And he took the Universal Studios tour in Hollywood and was so captivated by the sets in Hollywood that he jumped off the tram and snuck onto movie sets and was totally in love with the idea of uh, the set and being on the lot, that he decided the next day he came back, not as a tourist, but he wore his best suit, and he uh, brought a borrowed briefcase, and he walked by the security guard and waved at him like he knew what he was doing. And the security guard just let him in. And he kept doing that. And he found an empty office, and he squatted in it. And he put Steven Spielberg, director, on the office door. And he would go around the lot, and he would talk to editors and producers, and Everybody was really impressed by this young kid who, I mean, looked like a fetus. He was like 17, pimples on his face, but he was so eager and so passionate about filmmaking. And he also made an independent film. He got financing, he got a few thousand dollars to make this 35 millimeter film called Amblin, which uh, was just sort of this very mid-70s-ish road uh, romantic movie. It lasts about 15, 20 minutes. So he had a calling card. And he had his feature films that he made in high school. So when it was discovered what he was doing by some of these people in the business that he was meeting, he was introduced to Sid Sheinberg at Universal Studios, who was so impressed with this kid who had the moxie to show up at the studio like that. But like I was telling you before, he had done the groundwork, so he was ready when opportunity came knocking. They said, what do you want to do? What do you got? And he showed them his film. He showed them Amblin. So they were like, oh, well, OK, you know how to make a movie. It looks good. 
let's sign you to a TV directing contract, which was unheard of at the time. People who directed TV in the 70s were old men who had been in the union for years and they worked their way up. The idea of hiring some kid to do it was really unheard of. This was at the very beginning of the independent film movement of the 70s when I think Easy Rider had come out. It was one of the, the first independent films that actually made money. And there was this idea in Hollywood that there was this baby boomer generation, this generation of young people who kind of wanted more guerrilla filmmaking. They wanted more films for younger people. Hollywood was still very much stuck in the 50s and 60s when it came to films. The stars were all older and more established. The directors and producers were all older and more established. So they took a real chance on Steven Spielberg, but he made that chance happen for himself by having passion and by executing things himself. Okay, so let's say you actually have the opportunity to pitch something, even if you haven't done all the stuff I'm recommending about executing ideas yourself. I want to give you three essential ingredients for a successful pitch meeting. Number one, you have to have an idea worth pitching. That idea should be one that you've thought about fully. You know it inside and out. You can summarize it really quickly. You can give the elevator pitch, and then you can elaborate. And you can drill on any specific part of it if the development executive wants more details. Number two, bring your best self. You need to be on. And you need to be engaging. You need to be fun. You need to be interesting. You need to be one of the cool kids. You can't go in there as one of the not cool kids, because you'll never sell your idea. And lastly, you need to bring your enthusiasm and your passion. You need to demonstrate that you're the sort of person who can execute an idea, who's not going to stop until an idea is successful. Because that's what they want. Their career is hinging on who they decide to go into business with. They're not going to throw a bunch of money and opportunity at somebody that's just going to fumble the ball when they hand it to them. They want somebody who's going to run for a touchdown. And you need to exude that type of confidence and that type of competence. Those are the three essential ingredients. Here are three helpful ingredients. Number one, having an agent is really helpful. If you don't have an agent, you're probably pitching at like a pitch fest, or you knew somebody who knew somebody, and this is a low-level development executive. <clears throat> you're never going to pitch and sell, you're never going to successfully pitch your idea if you don't have an agent and you just go in as a friend of a friend or whatever. If you have an agent, you have a little bit of legitimacy because someone else believes in you. And also, you're seen as a more acceptable risk because someone has taken a risk already on you by representing you, etc. I want to give you a little story to illustrate the importance of agents and how to deal with agents if you are to get one. So when I made my first movie, Spaceman, I didn't have a movie agent. I had a book agent, I had a literary agent, but I didn't have a Hollywood agent to represent me for movies. When I finished my movie, a rough cut of my movie, I sent it around to Hollywood, just sent VHS tapes at random. And one of the places I sent it to was the William Morris Agency. I sent it to this particular agent named Ari Emanuel, who was known for representing independent filmmakers who got into Sundance. I got a call from his assistant after he saw the tape. And he was like, oh my god, this, this movie is amazing. Uh, tell us about it. Tell us about yourself. And I told him about myself, whatever. And he's like, Ari's going to call you. Ari's going to call you. Ari Emanuel calls me right back. He's like, dude, this is amazing. We're going to make everything happen for you. We're going to get into Sundance. You're going to be big. This is going to be huge. Honestly, I don't even know if he had seen the movie. I think he maybe saw the first five or 10 minutes and just listen to his assistant. So he asked me what was happening. That was his first question. What's, what's happening? What's going on with the movie? And I told him I was about to go to this thing called the Independent Film Market in New York, which was this thing they used to put on. It's a horrible event where filmmakers would go and pitch their movie ideas to development executives. So it was like 95% wannabe filmmakers, 5% development executives, and everybody had a different badge that you wore around your neck. The filmmakers was one color and the development executives was another color. The development executives would flip theirs over because they were constantly besieged in all the venues by people pitching them. 
and there's all these postcards for all these movies around, and they're all very amateurish, and it's very unlikely anybody's going to sell anything from there. But it was a thing that I got into, and I was going to go, and I told him that. He's like, awesome, let me, know what, let me know how it goes. So I go, and I have a screening at a weird time, but I meet a couple of industry people, and I get their cards, and he calls me literally from vacation. He's on the slopes, and he calls me from Utah or wherever, and he's like, dude, tell me all about what happened. And I made uh, my biggest mistake in, in my movie career. I told him what really happened, which was, ah, not much. I didn't, you know, I didn't sell it. I actually went to my friend's place, and uh, we got high and watched it at his house. That was it. I never heard from him again. That was it. It was the end. All I would have had to do was finesse the information a little bit. Tell him, yeah, I, got, I met a couple of people. I got their cards. I'll give them to you. He could have parlayed that and leveraged that into a bidding war. Who knows what could have happened? Ari Emanuel became the biggest agent in Hollywood. He ended up uh, taking over William Morris Agency. He created his own agency called Endeavor, and now it's William Morris Endeavor. He's like one of the most powerful people in Hollywood. Agents are like birds. They like shiny, moving things. And if you're not a shiny, moving thing, you're gone. So you need to be exciting. You need to be passionate. You need to be making things happen. That's how you uh, excite an agent. I have so much more to say about agents. I don't have time to today. But that's sort of the, uh, the, the main bullet point. Another helpful ingredient to have in a pitch is a track record. Have you sold other shows? Even if you've made other shows and they have a little bit of, uh, they've given you a little bit of standing, then you're, you're better off in a pitch meeting because then you come with a reputation that precedes you. If you don't have a track record, you can find someone with a track record to partner with to go in and pitch with. So I pitched an idea uh, to Comedy Central recently. It was an Onion idea. The Onion had made all these fake news shows and they had gotten successively less popular or successively less successful. And the idea was we need to come up with a show that is like The Onion but isn't fake news. So I came up with this uh, sitcom that was an animated sitcom called Area Man. It was just going to be about, the, about this regular guy who you could relate to. And I had never made uh, an animated TV show before unless you count that MTV thing, which I don't really because we were pitching to major networks now, not MTV. So I partnered with Steve Dildarian, who produced The Life and Times of Tim for HBO. And that gave me a lot more legitimacy and a lot more standing. And we sold the show to Comedy Central. So without that legitimacy, without that standing, we, we wouldn't have had a chance. So what is pitching, exactly? Here is what I think pitching is. Pitching is a meeting between potential coworkers. And that's how you should think of it. That person that you're pitching to is considering whether they want to work with you. Are you cool? Are you nice? Are you going to be fun to be around? Are you a hard worker? That's what I mean when I say your idea is worthless. Because you're not there to pitch your idea. You're there to pitch yourself. If your idea is great, that's a bonus. But you have to be great. If your idea is great and you're great, you've upped your chances of successfully pitching your idea by an enormous factor. So go in and pitch your idea, but don't be all business about it. Don't be nerdy about it. Don't be weird. Be friendly. Be nice. Be cool. Be somebody they would want to be friends with. Part of that is just be a normal person. Ask them about them. Uh, how, are, how are they doing? Do some research on them before you do the pitch meeting so you can congratulate them on the success they've recently had with a show they just sold or whatever. Or maybe they just won a Golden Globe Award for a show they produce. You want to know that going in so you can say, hey, great work on the thing or whatever. Then you're a normal person. Then you're like a peer. You're less a beta and more a peer, more a colleague. And here's a pro tip. Here's a pro hack. Invite them to a cool party. Every development executive wants to be connected to what's happening. What are the young people doing? Now, a lot of those people are young, but they're probably not going to be as young as you. 
So invite him to a party that you and your friends are having in Hollywood. It never fails. It never fails to at least put them on a level playing field with you. It often even makes you more uh, alpha to them. I know I use this language like alpha and beta. I'm telling you, it's, it's pertinent because that's how the industry is. But if you're inviting them to a cool party, suddenly you're in the position of power. And that's what you want to be in. Nobody's going to be in business with somebody who's, who they see as having less power than them. And then another pro hack, follow up with them after the meeting. Send them a thank you. Send them an email saying, hey, it was great meeting with you. Uh, if you have any interesting or pertinent information, or again, if something has happened in their career that you can email them about and say, hey, I saw that uh, your show was nominated for such and such. That's great. Way to go. Whatever. Just be cool, be positive, whatever. If they come to your party, by all means, be their buddy and text them and say, oh, dude, you were so wasted last night or whatever. Did, did you get the marker erased from your face? Um, whatever. Uh, I once did that. I had a meeting with somebody at Adult Swim pitching an idea. And the meeting went fine, but he didn't buy the idea. But I kept in touch with him by just a couple weeks later, introducing him to somebody else I knew who was really funny who had an idea. And he was so grateful and so appreciative. I don't think a lot of people think of that, to like have a reason to stay in touch and think, OK, how can I serve this person? What can I do that could help this person's career? All right. Again, it does more to level the playing field in terms of the power dynamic. How does a pitch meeting go? You wait in the lobby. You go in and you exchange pleasantries with the person. You pitch your idea. You thank them for their time and then you go. It's that simple. What can you expect from a pitch meeting? Number one, you can expect they will say no because you have a one in a million chance of selling your idea. However, they will never say no at the meeting. They might even say they love the idea, but then their people will tell your people after the meeting that they don't want the idea. Number two, you can expect that they will steal your idea. They may not, but expect them to. If you execute it yourself, it makes it far less likely that they'll steal it. Or if you successfully pitch it somewhere else, it's far less likely that they'll steal it. But if you're not doing anything with it and it's an amazing idea, they're probably going to steal it. So just know that going in. And number three, expect that they will probably be working somewhere else before too long. So don't burn the bridge. Be nice. They might be in an even more powerful position to give you an opportunity later. Uh, people, there's a lot of turnover in Hollywood. People change jobs a lot. OK, so how can you make the most of a pitch meeting? Number one, go to a lot of them. The people who do good in pitch meetings pitch a lot. So if you don't have an agent and you can't go to Hollywood pitch meetings, practice pitching your friends or pitch uh, lower level people in your community. Pitch them ideas and then ask for their feedback on how you did in the, in the pitch meeting. Certainly bring other ideas. Don't bring just one idea. You need idea number two, three, four, et cetera. Because if they don't like your first idea, they're going to say, well, what else you got? And you need to show that you're prolific. And number three, respect their time. Try to read their vibe and don't sit there and dilly-dally and talk slow or uh, not get to the point. You know, do, do your thing, be super cool and friendly and get the hell out of there. And finally, just have fun. People like people who are likable. So be a fun person. Go in there and be fun and charming and nice. It's almost more important than the idea just being cool and fun. OK, so my advice, if you haven't gleaned it already, is make them want your idea so much that they're pitching you. Like MTV came, they started pitching me. Andrews McNeil pitched me. I didn't pitch them. Some of my biggest opportunities were people pitching me, not me pitching them. I didn't pitch The Onion when it started, but when it got famous, I got calls every day from agents, from TV producers, pitching me. Please do a TV show with us. That's the position you want to be in. You want to be in the position of power. And you're in an even more powerful position when you say no to those people. There was a company in Hollywood that wanted to make a TV show with me so bad. They got 
one of the producers of Not Necessarily the News, which is this famous TV news comedy show in the 70s and 80s. They got him attached. They were a big company. I'm not going to say the name of the company just because I don't want to embarrass them. But they called and said, we, we want to make a TV show with you. And they brought a limousine to my house to take me to the airport, flew me first class to Hollywood, got a limousine to take me from the airport to the best hotel in Hollywood, brought me to their pitch meeting. They pitched me their TV show idea. Limousine back, first class back, limousine back to my house. I said no. I stayed in touch with them. Uh, that producer went on to produce really big, successful movies. Every time one came out, I would congratulate him, and he would always write me back and say, hey, thanks, man. It's so great for you to say. Um, that's how careers are built in Hollywood, by making little connections, by being more powerful, but not being a jerk about it, being nice about it, but being in the more powerful position. Saying no is the most powerful thing you can do in Hollywood, because people don't expect it. They expect you to be desperate, and you're going to just latch on to any opportunity that they give you. I even said no when I had no business saying no. When I first put my first movie out to Hollywood, there were a couple of distribution companies that offered to buy it for nothing. And this is pretty standard now in the independent film world. They'll offer you literally a zero dollar deal to distribute your movie. And I said no. And my producer's rep was like, oh my god, dude, you have no idea how, how much cred that gives you. So he was able to go to other companies who started offering me more money. I ended up selling it for, I think, like $20,000. So barely paid for the production of the movie. But it was something. You know, it was something. OK, so here's some miscellaneous tips about pitching. Take the drink and do so boldly. Because the drink that you get when you're waiting for your pitch meeting is likely the only thing you're ever going to get from that company. So be specific. Tell, ask them, uh, have you got uh, Mountain Spring uh, Valley water? Uh, could you put a lime in it? Get, get the fanciest beverage you possibly can get from the assistant. Also, that gives you standing. It makes you seem like you're powerful. You're accustomed to being served really fancy water. Number two, but again, don't be a jerk about it. Be nice to the assistant, too, because the assistant is going to be a development executive in a few months, and you're going to be pitching to them, or they might be pitching to you if the tables turn. Number two, read Writing Movies for Fun and Profit by Tom Lennon and Ben Grant. It's the best movie, I'm sorry, it's the best book I know about pitching comedy movies in Hollywood. Super realistic, super good, and pretty entertaining. Number three, take improv classes. You need to be comfortable in your own skin. You need to be funny and engaging and cool. And when people take improv, that's what they get out of it. Even if they don't get on the main stage at Second City and cast on SNL, they're comfortable in their own skin and they're good in a room. And that's what you need to be to pitch successfully. And four, know your concept inside and out and be able to summarize it well. Because like I said, they're going to ask you details about it. They're going to want to drill into it. But when you first talk to them, you need to give them the, uh, the, the tent pole high points, the genre, uh, the, the, the comparison, like what's it like, um, what kind of uh, main character is it. Give them a real clear, what, what medium is it? Is it a TV show? Um, is it a web series, movie, whatever? Know it inside and out. And that goes for all your concepts, not just your number one. Any questions? Surely there's one question. Did I miss anything? I know, I think I, I, think I covered everything pretty well, right? Thank you, Kat. Much appreciated. Um, 